Thank you guys for being here. And since uh, I was asking about the timing, I will be allowed to give you a brief introduction about what happened in Konas in the past uh, month. Uh, we were actually the end of September, the beginning of October, because uh, simultaneously, whatever magic thing happened <laughs> at a certain point, uh, as most of the time, a bit of a lucky is not uh, that bad to have in the developments of your project. Um, and just in this 15 minutes, 20 maximum, uh, we'll have the time to give you a briefly introductions about how we land in Konas with this activity and what was actually the main purpose. Everything started during the pandemic, uh, an application for a maker in residency at the JRC, the Joint Research Center in Ispra Varese in Italy, together with a former bachelor student from Konas University of Technology Design Center here. She's now a master at Delft University um, Design for Sustainable Development. Uh, we were start working together with Open Dot Fab Lab, where she had her internship there on a toolkit. I mean, at the end of that internship, uh, she started working on a toolkit, a design toolkit that was including a practical activity to be organized in Milan in about a year. So the residency was actually founding this, uh, this program in JRC. But according to the restrictions that was ongoing at that time, it was not possible for them to provide all of the infrastructures, the laboratory, the center itself that the residency was including. So we just brought all of our jobs and we tried to organize in Milan. I found a very good partner. Eventually, some of you already heard about the Cascina Biblioteca is running a very interesting project of reactivation close to Lambrate station in the Lambrate district. Uh, called the Giardino San Faustino. The Giardino San Faustino is a shared uh, garden where they have installed the greenhouses, uh, be whatever uh, hives, uh, and uh, they do have on a purpose kept some so-called wild spots where they are growing wild plants and taking care about the animals, the flora and the fauna. It, it's been preserved as much as possible as the autochthon one. So the conditions was to us in like a month to move everything to the to these urban areas. So to find the partners, to find um, participants, spread the communications, and so on and so on. Uh, at that pilot, uh, I have involved some of my internships. Uh, I'm also teaching Internet of Robotic Things at Siam School in Milan uh, because uh, our main goal, together with, uh, let's say, the toolkit of the uh, B Hotel itself, uh, the developments and the optimizations of all of the materials and techniques that have been used to be cut, designed, and then later mounted by the participants was to bring some technologies in it. I mean, uh, our main goal since the beginning was to work parallelly on this to the, on the same directions, but let's say um, the design part and the technological part is always represented the, 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 the most let's say, important aspect that we cared about. Why? We are trying to, every time, measuring the impact throughout whatever sensors we can connect to the toolkit itself. So we started in Milan, and then uh, after one year monitoring, uh, we came up with some issues that the toolkit had. It was the very first trials, the very first test. So we designed um, a two-stage activity in Konas for the toolkit improvements, uh, which was not just related to the designs of, of the... Um, later, I'm going to show you some, some, some images about uh, the objects itself. Um, the main issue that we faced was about the damages provoked by predators like birds 
and uh, so on that from time to time we're actually destroying the nest itself so the bee hotel right we were working at that time and we are still going on in working on two main kind of nest the ground unit uh, and the trees one so we are also digging like 50 centimeters the ground finding the soils mixing up the materials conducting research on them on the other hand the workshop activities has always been split in two main let's say stages the morning sessions and the afternoon sessions during the morning sessions in milan we were developing some um, workshop and some canvases that were helping us in going through this psychological approach uh, that in urban areas especially uh, those who live in, in high density populations Europe populated urban areas has co have compared to insects in general and the wild nature in general because there are very two opposite kind of environment to let co-live in, in, in the same let's say space Milan under this point of view is a is a bit more regulated than Konas so there are some restrictions uh, in installing these wild spots around the cities and uh, the distance that they have to maintain from next the, the next closer building for instance in order not to disturb citizens because there is these things that wild nature somehow is is actually can, can be dangerous let's say so the first part of the workshop was a uh, was a uh, design from my students from cm from this internet of robotic things course and it was a ux a ui uh, workshop where we took interviews uh, by provoking uh, they were actually blind participants uh, with headphones uh, we have recreated artificially the environment to all of the participants uh, that were not actually introduced to the to what it was going on at that time and we have uh, reproduced artificially the perceptions uh, of something something that is flying is start flying so a flying insect uh, not not very well defined at the beginning a bee a mosquito or uh, whatever we had we didn't went through this much detail to register and to record the, the reactions uh, of the people when an insect is getting closer to them what's our natural and most instinctively <laughs> approach so we record this uh, 15 like 16 videos and we were also provoking some um let's say uh pinch with with some 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 needles some some whatever uh as a consequence of the different reactions that we have collected we were working together as psychologists from uh, Bicocca University um, the Milan's pilot uh, came up with the fact that uh, what next also together with Marta from Futuribile we spoke about uh, a little bit that pilot uh, these wild spots uh, supposed to develop in like like to to go together with uh, the acceptance from the citizenships uh, and uh, the the possibility to install the, at least a quite good amount of these wild spots around the urban area so conas entered at that time because at that time conas fortress uh, that belongs to the territory we are dealing uh, with uh, for the reactivations of the former helicopter base is really next to it uh, and they own a plot of land at about 1,200 square meters. So uh, Egidius from Conas Fortress told us, okay, you can use that land because it's completely abandoned, uh, it's part of the territory of Alexotas that is gonna be turned to the IPP. And we decided to do there the second pilots, not only, and eventually we turned also the purpose, not only to test and improve the design of the toolkit and replicate the Milan's model, but also to install the physically the very first wild spot that will be maintained for the next six years 
during the renovations of the area because the area and the whole reconstructions of the area will be a huge impact on the environment, digging the ground, moving soils and so on and so on. We're talking, you know, uh, Alex Cotas is quite a, a few hectares of, of, of territory. So it's a, it's a huge thing and it's gonna be a big impact, especially because of the previous military purpose. We don't even know what's actually under that ground we're gonna find we can't figure it out. So the workshop in Konas has been organized uh, in Konas Fortress, which is the location now I can start sharing my screen uh, and, uh, and joining the, yeah, the Myro. The thing that, as you can see, all of the activities are have been carried out in Lithuanian language. Uh, this is a, th a thing that, to me, gave a lot of added value to the whole workshop because the local communities have been activated throughout, uh, mainly Juste, who came from uh, uh, from Delft and spent here a couple of weeks together with me, and uh, thanks to. Da, 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 da. Where is the partners we locally collected? Now I'm going to show you the. Yep. Of course, Design Library Konos, but these four partners you see here, the Atuvos Kulturo Stariba is the Lithuanian Cultural Council that works at governmental level to support initiatives around Lithuania generally, let's say, related to the cultural industries. But most importantly, the contributions we collected from botanists and biologists from the universities and from the botanical garden, who gave the introductions, the initial introductions in the first part of the day. So workshop where to? September the 28th, we organized exactly the replica of the Milan's workshop pilot for the just for sharing the experience with a group of students of biomimicry courses uh, and let them, let's say, really put their hand on, hands on on, on, of the, on the issues and the problems that the toolkit itself has. Then the second part on October the 5th, we have redesigned uh, a new kind of uh, workshop uh, specifically dedicated to these activities and this territory with the partners. Uh, so we transfer the techniques, let's say, in the manufacturing, waxing, laser cutting, designing uh, the, the, the parts of the toolkit. And then um, we collected the local partners. After uh, the, the theory, actually, this Ritzardas is the, botanic, the botanist who came here. We, we went outdoor. This is the area. We do have a greenhouse, a demolished one here that is now uh, the, the, our main goal in the next month is to restore this greenhouse and let it be fully functional and keeping it with uh, uh, the technologies for monitoring, uh, the growing of the plants, uh, the raising of the group of insects that are gonna live there and so on and so on. Unfortunately, we have to wait due to the weather <laughs> that we are not going here in Lithuania at the moment. We just need to wait the beginning for the spring. So there are now three months where we are preparing all the communications materials. At the end of this month, we will publish the website. So this is the area. Uh, participants went there to map the spots where to install uh, the hives and the ground units. They were actually equipped with all of the we used mainly cardboard and the natural wax for the waterproofing uh, for the waterproofing systems and this is the moment where on the second part so the second day of the workshop the one dedicated to konas uh, um they were trying to deal with uh, parts of the previous toolkit and uh, the solutions for the fixing the reparations and so on and so on some of the installings uh, and uh, the ground units that we worked with. Now they have been installed uh, 
And uh, let me go through because we're talking about this area just to let you better understand how big is it. What is frame? What I am framing here. This is Kona's Fortress, our partner, and this is the land. And and here where you see the the yellow line is already starting the Alex Sotas area that will be part of the renovation. So the idea is to install this wild spot here, all around, and to maintain the as much wild as possible for the whole renovations of the part of the period. Um, well, going through the Myra, so we analyze all of the living species over there. We, the, the botanist and uh, with the professor that I introduced you before, talk about uh, the kind of uh, wild plants and insects that went there. They mapped the area. They decided and picked up the spot where to install. We installed five different units uh, for the trees and two ground units in about uh, two days of work. We brought all of the materials there. We picked up by the, from the surroundings. I mean, nothing that is not locally sourced actually have been uh, uh, used over there. Our next goal is to publish the website and um, and then to start uh, moving on the next step of the realizations, the technologies, the environmental technologies for the monitoring of the nests themselves and the collections of data. Uh, there is a short, uh, no, there is, at the moment, there is like three hours of registry or recording videos of the nest and all of the insects and we are analyzing uh, let's say by watching it, uh, so very an analogic way. Um, the, the species of insects that went there to live and so on and so on. We are looking for some more, let's say, automatic way. So we're looking for sensors for mobility. And now is the phase that during the winter time, we are gonna analyze all of the available technologies to be installed on the next spring uh, in this wild spot for data collections this is more or less the resume of what we are doing let's say that we are facing now the phase of the the tech part the digital things how to outsource data from insects and plants behaviors in this wild spot great Thank, thank you, Lore. Is it, I mean, anything to add? Otherwise, I would leave the floor for questions or feedback, if you agree. I think there was already a question in the chat from Adam asking whether the, um, the restoration of the greenhouse is meant to be a stable use. So if you can say something more about that. Sorry for my background noise. Yes, sure. The, the fact that we found there a greenhouse was actually a, one of the biggest shift in the development of the project, Adam, because uh, in Lithuania, there, after the independence, actually, they have been assigned automatically to all of the Lithuanian citizens uh, a plot of ground uh, to install their, their old greenhouses. So they are all of the Lithuanians own a piece of land where to grow their vegetables some of them have been reactivated yeah sodas i mean all of them have uh, at least like 500 square meter where to grow their vegetables not in some of them are in the cities some of them are outside actually but it have been assigned according to what was before the occupations, uh, the family who belongs to that plot of grounds. So it's very diffused thing uh, that some of them haven't has been assigned, but haven't been reactivated. Never in the past 30 years. So this plot of ground that is right beside uh, Kona's fortress uh, is actually 
at the top uh, of a military bunker. So down exactly under that territory. So it's not possible to do nothing more. So the purpose of that piece of land cannot and will never be changed. They cannot actually build any whatever structures on it because there is a, a bunker underground, like 10 meters underground. So it's not possible to bring their electricity, water supplies, and so on and so on. So the preconditions uh, for the determination of this, te this territory and that specific greenhouse are intended to be permanent. What we are looking for is to find local uh, grants and local applications that are specifically. So we are in contact also with other organizations that already delivered uh, here in Konas, but also in other cities in Lithuania, delivered projects similar on biodiversities and so on. Then eventually we can exchange the technological know-how with the developments that they already did uh, in order to create this network of partners that locally can contribute to the realizations of this uh, greenhouse. But yes, since the purpose of that territory cannot be changed for, let's say, mandatory reasons, um, the goal is to let this wild spot be permanent then later. We are at a very early stage of the developments, but yes. Yeah, Lorenzo, thank you for presentation. For the question to, of Adam, it is uh, part of uh, the stable activities that ha uh, have been planned in our portfolio. It is uh, part of Kona's Fortress community space because uh, they already, uh, when they planned to transfer their office there and they have practices in other fortress uh, on the implementing uh, urban garden together with uh, uh, citizens so uh, we thought uh, that we could replicate first of all this uh, let's say initiative also in Alaxotas and that is why we brought the biodiversities project there because uh, they see this land plot as uh, stable use uh, uh, and part of Kona's Fortress community space. So yes, it is. <laughs> yes, I was looking on the plan on the Myro, if there is already exactly when this is gonna happen, uh, but let's say it's not like, I was trying just to bring some evidence of what we are talking about. Francesca, I think you, yeah, you have, your hands raised. Yes, um, uh, I have many questions actually, <laughs> because um, uh, as uh, as we already told you, Lorenzo and Ruta, we are uh, working on on something very close to what you to what you did, even though slightly different. Uh, because in our case, uh, uh, we are working with um, kids uh of uh i mean the, the last year of primary school uh, the first uh, two years of secondary schools um and uh, we are engaging them in a uh, on-field activity uh during which we will provide them with uh we, we want to provide them with prefabricated elements uh, for building uh, uh, bugs hotels, uh, but also maybe uh, bird nests and uh, yeah, I mean, so reflecting also on birds and not only on, on insects. Uh, afterward, uh, we will install them into, into mind area. And uh, we would like also to equip uh, these uh, these houses uh, for insects and birds uh, built by by kids uh, with uh, some uh, technology for monitoring. Uh, so my question is, um, and and we are uh, we are studying too in order to do that. Uh, I mean, why for the prefabricated elements? Uh, this is something we can easily do with with our design competencies and the makerspace uh, in, in Polimi and so on. 
the uh, moni monitoring part here is something uh, a bit out of our competencies. So uh, we are we are studying on uh, on them as well. Uh, so do you think there is a possibility to uh, share uh, knowledge on this uh, into into more detail during the process or even maybe collaborate in a way so that we kind of exchange the units and uh, and maybe I don't know we try to figure out a bigger sample. Uh, the answer is actually yes, but it's a yes a little bit bigger than ju addressed just to you because we are releasing everything on a GitHub repository and releasing uh, open source. Yeah, we everything that we are the, the, we are developing. Uh, the website that I was mentioning you before, okay. there is already a page on GitHub where we are sharing uh, all of the, and even more, especially the module related to UX, UI experience that we did in Milan uh, um, due to the fact that this project was supposed to be a residency at the JRC. There is already a small community of engineers that have been built around. Uh, Yes, for sure. So the only thing is that if you are asking me to share it during the development, it means that I need someone in your team that can be involved directly in the process. On the other hand, uh, we should wait for the end of the deliverings uh, to share the results, actually. Yeah, of course. It's just two different ways that you... Just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, tell but me I mean, which I was, one you prefer. I, I, I was thinking something like, yeah. I mean, we, we maybe have a chat uh, during which we share the knowledge we have collected so far, the ideas on what sensors to use, and so on and so forth. And then uh, maybe in the end, uh, uh, of course, uh, we can, uh, we can. Well, the main, the main, the main technological challenge is about uh, how to power all of that technologies because we are talking about off-grid of course functions that should yeah, be yeah, well, we, than... we have the same issues actually. yeah and we are also aiming to put them open source so yeah I, we are very aligned on that so i that did i did i already did develop with some of my former students uh, some so-called bio machines i have a seismograph here completely off-grid uh, at the design center of KTU, and we were working on several other deliveries. So, if you want, uh, we can, of course, uh, um, speak about that. Yeah, great. That will be great. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for sharing the presentation. It's really, it's really, really interesting and and impressive, really structured piece of work. Um, I'm just wondering. I think for me, it feels like. Um, a lot of the work within the pilots, and I think this is a good example, is applying this quite uh, sort of agile social innovation approach of sort of this recombining of existing assets into the context of the of the two factor project. Um, so you were describing that this this project, if I understood it correctly, was developed as a as a JRC um, project uh, in Milan. Uh, in Milan, yeah. And, then um, and there there was a network um some knowledge some resources some methodologies that were that were developed um and then within the Calnas fortress context there is this opportunity that arises um for the implementation and iteration of the project in that local context um and then also the you've got the the course with the students that's there as another sort of asset that can be leveraged and brought into into play and then i'm just interested in the more from a more general perspective and again based on some conversations we've been having recently about eventually how will we how we will be reporting on some of the prototypes and some of the sort of lessons learned and some of the characteristics of the approaches that we use within these uh, within these two factor pilots and within the prototypes that are produced, and I just think it's really the project itself is 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 really it looks great to me, um, and the and the way it fits within the within the sort of the the, the greening sort of uh, thematic um, is a really neat fit with two factor, 
But what I'm particularly interested in and what I like and what I think we should try and make sure we capture in this instance and in other instances is the way in which T factor um, assembles these different, basically is able to be emergent and agile in its approach, um, which is an infrastructuring approach. You know, so not everything is actually predetermined and, and predefined. Um, things shift and leverage the, and recombine the assets that are available to them. Um, because it, it feels to me that that's a, a characteristic of, of, um, of some of the pilot projects uh, as they move towards really trying to realistically find ways to deliver. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that, um, to, to congratulate you on the work, I think it's great, but also to comment to try and make sure we capture these, um, these uh, perhaps nuances and these specific characteristics that, 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 are, that, are, that might be common to some of the T-Factor implementations. Because this project wasn't designed for T-Factor from the outset, right? It's sort of it's something that sort of cross combines and and makes use of an opportunity, if I've understood it correctly. Um, as I was telling you before, then eventually I forgot some to mention a couple of details during my presentation as well. It's not technically like landed in Konas from the outside, especially because Konas Fortress uh, representatives, so Egidius and his team, are the beekeepers of the city of Konas too. And one of the projects that they are running in a district which is called Shilani here, the Shilani project, uh, is about the reactivations uh, and active citizenship and communities around Konas in that particular Soviet popular district that are in the neighborhood on the, of, in, in this, let's say, geographic area and pretty much diffused in this geographic area. Uh, so it was like a sum of several factors uh, that came along, came together and it said, okay, that's the perfect conditions to bring our contribution to it. But to try to follow your comments uh, as also a strategy to be adopted among the pilots uh, and these kind of activities. My answers to Laura's first question uh, at the beginning of the meetings, if we can open it up, these kinds of presentations to all of the partners that we have involved. And this is also for Francesca the reply, because what they are doing in Shileni project, since they don't have technological competencies to do with this environmental censorship, they are activating what they are doing, workshop with kids and families during the weekends, right? Building uh, the things. The only, um, going through a little bit more technical to the analysis of the differences in between our workshop and, uh, let's say, generally speaking, the others. And since we were conducting this workshop with some more uh, skilled, uh, let's say, participants, so familiar with uh, rapid prototyping technologies, uh, also the acting citizenships that we activated around because the territory of Alex Sotas, because the second workshop on October the 5th have been open to the public. So we received also contributions from from local communities uh, and that uh, to me the highest value that is as a t factor and every time i'm speaking with a partner trying to involve them into our activities is at a certain point to create this contact in between yours francesca or ours partner more than between me and you that we can chat each other at any time we want the biggest added value that we can give is to go strategically this way to manage the the the, yeah. the consortium also in a wider meaning let's say ruta if yeah. you're raising your sorry, hands they, sorry if i interrupt ruta if it's brief briefly feel free yeah. to move yeah, yeah just a comment uh, on uh, adam's question so uh, of course we are not uh, bringing the things that uh, are not, uh, how to say, thematically connected uh, to our portfolio. So uh, we have a portfolio of our meanwhile users and the stable ones. And uh, I think it's okay to bring in the competence and uh, maybe some results that are already there because we did it strategically. We applied for funding, additional funding, because we all know that 
uh, we do not have maybe enough uh, budget within the factor to deliver all the meanwhile users. So it was quite planned actually. Um, so this would be my comment because we somehow we have to uh, uh, attract uh, competence, attract uh, additional funding uh, in order to deliver what we have planned. Good. Thank, thanks, Ruta. By the way, now we... Yeah, I wasn't, just, just to be clear, I, I wasn't suggesting that it was unplanned. I was suggesting that um, I think it's true of all the T-factor projects in the way you just described, that there's not necessarily the resource available within the project it to be able to deliver its ambitions particularly in terms of the pilots without attracting external funding and resources and tapping into external networks or additional networks um, and i think it's important that we somehow capture that um, within the within the way in which we report on the on the projects um, and i think there's also interesting challenges around additionality um, so which bits are attribute attribution and additionality which bits are attributed to um, T factor and which bits are JRC and which bits are um, Countess Fortress and how do these things come together? You know, what is that? Yeah, the, what is it that brings exactly. them together? Yeah, yeah, it is the recipe actually that we yeah. are now trying out, um, and we can see what uh, uh, what is working and uh, which is the situation when we cannot manage. Uh, and uh, uh, how to say to 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 attract this meanwhile users because uh, we have already discovered let's say different kind of situations and uh, scenarios so yeah of course we have to repel that good uh, guys sorry to interrupt but time wise we need to move uh, forward with chris so uh, as i'm not sure if we can all remain for more time so uh, yeah, for those who can remain, then we can uh, go back also to Lorenz and Ruta for additional questions. Thank you all. And thank you, Lorenz, for the presentation. Chris, do you want to move on? Thank you, Laura. Yeah, and, and thanks, Lorenz, for the presentation. It was really interesting. And Francesca and Lorenzo, I think it's good if we maybe team up also for a like, specific knowledge exchange session in like really particular practical uh, sense. So what I prepared for today... Um, is sort of a short version um, of our work on our ecology lab because that really emerged from the T-Factor work and it, and it represents a number of our sort of lessons learned in the way we're also trying to project that outwards towards uh, new uh, projects. So I'll kind of use that to talk a bit about uh, sort of our reflections on this dealing with green in a complex uh, governance system uh, in an urban environment, because of course, I think what's so interesting about these kinds of projects is we're really have staging this encounter between like highly built up, highly cultivated space and then trying to bring wild spots back in, bring nature back in so that, yeah, it has a really um, valuable site to experiment with these human non-human relations as, as we frame them. So just to sort of set the stage, I think, you know, the the main thing we're learning here is, is how to tell this story because it's a different story than we're used to speaking in terms of urbanism. Um, and the backdrop of that story is, is, is biodiversity loss. So the, the stripes you're seeing are similar to the ones you know probably from the climate going from blue to, to uh, increasingly red as temperatures warm up historically. And this is a new image that's been made of biodiversity uh, on a planetary scale. So here you see what's happening to planetary diversity, uh, biodiversity in the past, uh, I think, 50 years. So I guess uh, this slide is just to say that, uh, you know, like, if anything, we need to renew our relationship with the living world. And that's kind of like the, the default position from which we work. So all the pragmatics about the advantages of green, uh, maybe policy orientations for us kind of come after this sort of cultural urgency to, to realign uh, ourselves. And that's what we've been experimenting with, with all these kind of activities and practices. Um, but of course, Sorry, we're still seeing the cover. Is it normal? You're already sliding? So ah, well. sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Thanks for saying. So yes, here are the stripes, right? So this is, I think, just a really sort of simple visual reminder of the, the planetary kind of questions we're facing and which you try to tackle in a, in a local scale, but also as a, as a cultural uh, a challenge, which uh, in a sense is really central, I think, to what we're learning about meanwhile practices, but it's also 
uh, slightly more intangible than maybe getting some kind of structure set up a greenhouse or or otherwise. So that's something we're navigating and and is also thematic for for this story. Um, so when you talk about these cultural connections, it can sound very either artistic or maybe a bit new agey or holistic. But this is a recent study showing all the pathways that scientific papers have been charting between um, human well-being, culture, and uh, the living world. And this shows that, you know, when it comes to kind of like setting up green spaces or working uh, with biodiversity, that there's this whole world of value and cultural values uh, behind that, that you can kind of play with, uh, experiment with, and try to, to establish these uh, these connections, you know, from, from sense of place to spiritual value and from physical health to uh, sort of the ability to reflect on our position in the world. So uh, there's this really rich uh, toolbox in, inside this quite impressive uh, flow chart that we try to bring into the conversation uh, now to kind of activate also with stakeholders, the fact that working with ecosystems with biodiversity is always multidimensional. So you're never just doing one thing, right? So there's never just a singular goal or, or a payoff from an intervention. There's this really rich tapestry of, uh, of benefits that emerge. And this is really important we found to, to emphasize, um, to kind of gain space and traction in, in the pilot context. So yeah, um, I, I think the reference is here. I'll share the uh, presentation later. It's a really nice study to argue the value of meanwhile uh, green activities. So what we've also done now, uh, and this is just basically T-factor learnings, is, is to try to formulate what are the principles that we have to uh, take into account when we're doing this kind of stuff. So first of all, bringing these really planetary questions to a really uh, local and small scale, situating them in the here and now, um, really focusing on the practice-based aspect. So it's easy to keep on having workshops with knowledge sharing, but how do you force people every time to, to, to do interventions? Uh, either approved or semi-approved by uh, by the authorities of the of the local space to also instigate in people a sense of being able to do these kinds of things themselves uh, separate from 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 what we're proposing or offering as programs. So the relational complexity I just talked about, yeah, and I think the open-endedness is is important to note uh, as well that. You know, as natural systems are adaptive and, and form themselves uh, according to their context, I think what we really learned here at Science Park is also to what Adam, in a sense, was also saying to be very adaptive in the programming and to try to follow that up with infrastructuring so that this um, iterative, uh, sprinting, uh, agile way of working has a uh, practice-based front and then uh, has an infrastructuring that's that's following that. Um, but that's less spatially oriented and more, uh, as we'll see in one or two slides. Um, yeah, there's different variants on what an infrastructuring is from, from meanwhile to, to permanence we found when it comes to greening. And of course, we work with artists and try to emphasize subjective uh, experience in the participants to really get uh, mind shifts going in terms of how we perceive uh, our environments. And I think the work with Marta on wild spots, combining questions of technology, unplugging from technology, and so to speak, plugging into green and wilderness is a really interesting experiment that's happening in Kaunas and, and we'll work on coming year uh, in Amsterdam as well. And so that means that like on the one hand, we're working with these really crunchy, small scale, uh, making messy corners, uh, trying to let people understand that mess is not um, yeah, that mess is not uh, necessarily a bad thing, but it's also a house uh, for lots of animals. So this is a very tangible, simple way of doing doing workshops and, and shifting the perception of space and of, of, of what's supposed to be in a, neat, uh, in a neat science park space and what isn't. So on the one hand, that's very hands-on, tangible, uh, basic workshop stuff and on the other hand we bring in artists to kind of like enlarge those images and enlarge those performances uh, of how we can perceive these landscapes and how we can can work with them and in particular the coming year this is what we really have high expectations from as we now have two artistic residencies doing their research they will be starting to release their first 
like interventions and results uh, early next year. Um, so sorry for the Dutch uh, subtitles, but the, the main titles here are actually the only point I wanted to share is that basically we've come now to three methodologies that we use. And, and the most important one is basically just saying like, we all know co-creation, we all know participative processes, but we really emphasize now the fact that you can also do those with, with more than humans, uh, with other life. And that's actually a really interesting and provocative way to think about co-creation to people to open up the scope uh, of what it means to work together and, and the imagination and the and the interesting worlds that that opens up. So, so we found it, especially with, with young people, to be a really uh, rewarding track that we that we think is something, yeah, that's basically worth sharing um, as, a, as a way of looking, as a way of talking about these kinds of greening uh, projects. Mm. I think I'll skip the artistic research. Um, yeah, the arts of noticing, basically, uh, I don't know if, if we talked about this a lot in the context of, uh, of the T-Factor board that we're in now, but for us, it's a really important starting point when we talk about shifting culture and shifting attitudes through this hands-on interventions. This idea of being able to notice what's, what's living all around you is, is a really simple uh, intervention to do but really crucial to kind of snap out of a classical urbanistic framework, which is very architectonic, which is very much about build space, about logistics and about separations of space towards a, a perspective on, on, on the city as, as a living place, uh, almost an ethnographic perspective and an, uh, anthropological perspective on the city that includes uh, a non-human. So yeah, these are, I think, two elements that we've now sort of distilled from our work. Um, which we feel worth sharing among the consortium. Um, we've been doing a number of programs. I don't know if I'll go into all of them now, just looking at the time, because Laura, sorry to interrupt the presentation for a moment. A number of people have to leave at three, right? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I extended until 3.30, so, but I'm not sure if all can remain, so yeah. yeah. Okay, but then I'll make it into a presentation that ends at three and then we can we can discuss further uh, after that. Um, so yeah, I guess if we talk about the program, um, a lot of things from Kaunas were, were recognizable, um, doing all these ki different kinds of workshops that are also uh, uh, interventions in the space, um, trying to understand how we can also convey the knowledge and the experiences in these workshops in terms of what we call field notes, either being more narrative, fictional, speculative accounts of what people have experienced, looking into certain habitats for animals, looking into certain spaces, what they can do to enhance the, the wilderness patches there to increase uh, biodiversity. Um, so that we can also start to share these experiences. So we're, we're starting up uh, different types of um, yeah, sharing content, let's say, uh, on that level to see also if that is an invitation to people to participate more, because I think one of the main challenges we all find in T Factor is how to kind of create that critical mass uh, of participation. And I think that both has to do with the way you um, present the programs. So to the extent to which it's both a practical and an imaginative and inviting type of practice, but also how you create a feedback loop to keep people on board to keep people involved, be it through counting the, the animals and trying to keep track of the biodiversity interventions or through more narrative uh, methods of accounting. Um, so having been doing all these kinds of workshops now for, I guess, uh, one and a half years, um, the second phase, if you like, uh, is now like really clear to us that there's kind of three elements to how you can infrastructure all this kind of emergent work. Um, the first is, of course, to try to create a hub. So I think a number of, of pilots are trying to do so. Um, we are also now in a conversation with the Science Park to maybe hopefully um, become part, so make the Urban Ecology Hub part of a semi-permanent uh, site that will be established also for music and, and, uh, and sports, I think. So we said like, okay, if it's about music and sports, about culture and, and, and health, let's add ecology to that mix because that actually speaks to both these topics for students and well-being. 
um, but also to create a digital interface. So I'm also curious about uh, the, the digital platform that Kaunas is making to create a digital interface that kind of represents the work we're doing here and the, and the involvement of different uh, both, let's say, collectives or more organized groups and, and just individuals who are enth enthusiastic about this kind of work. And the third element that we've really uh, gotten clear on when it comes to infrastructure is that there's always a lot of a kind of ambient enthusiasm among different uh, groups for this green work, people who are intrinsically motivated or like gardening, etc. And there's often, especially in Science Park, there's also a couple of small initiatives that are actively uh, working on greening, but they're actually not collaborating a lot and they can't find each other well. So for us, it was a really big takeaway from the last consortium meeting. Uh, the responsibility we have with a project like this to really try to infrastructure those networks into something that has a voice that can be heard uh, by policymakers and authorities so to help them to organize uh, better in a mutualistic network as we learned that it's called in the in the workshop so i think for us going into this uh, last year of the pilot now these are really three focal points to create legacy and to really uh, sink in foundations for for further greening projects once the project ends uh, here at Science Park. So the field atlas now is in development. Uh, we figured out a way to create a map that's constantly adapting to uh, the, the digital maps that are available online. So it always pre presents an accurate image uh, of, the, of the site and we'll add to this biodiversity observations and all the additions from um, field note taking, all the interventions we do, um, we have a data structure for this now, and we'll hope to present to you the first version of this map um, in two months, uh, I think, two and a half, end of February, beginning of March, um, which will really try to, um, yeah, at, at a hyper local level, present this representation also to city planners, to policy makers of all the energy, all the interventions, all the activities that are happening at the science park to hopefully move them also towards understanding the value uh, and presence of these uh, activities at the park. Mm, okay. Let's see how we are for time. Okay, so in the previous three months, approximately, we've been doing a number of things and I'll just uh, note them uh, in the interest of time shortly. So the first is an urban ecology table, which is, let's say, a gathering of all the people from universities uh, in Amsterdam and a municipality who are working on uh, ecology uh, studies, research projects in the city. We brought them all together to uh, our site here at Science Park to discuss uh, urban ecology from a civic and artistic perspective. So really opening up, let's say, their scientific research practices to more subjective, intrinsically motivated and, and imaginative practices. This is one of the breakout groups you're seeing here with the urban ecologists and others uh, present. So we're really happy to kind of like also establish ourselves as a relevant research partner. Um, within this network in Amsterdam and, and kind of open up their thinking also to, as I said, civic and artistic practices. So it was a really rewarding uh, session and I think also good for the status of the pilot to be able to uh, yeah, stand on equal footing with these uh, research initiatives. Oh. Sorry, yeah. So because we don't have a, 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 an urban ecology hub yet, we uh, borrowed from some friendly artists uh, a small pop-up hub just to manifest ourselves in the space. Uh, we also filled a number of huge um, wheelbarrows. Wheelbarrow, thank you, Florida. Okay. Wheelbarrows with, with plants just to try to also already start to kind of like stimulate this thinking with the policymakers. Like this is interesting if it happens, people pass by are all very interested, uh, have a little uh, talk um about it so these are ways we're trying to sort of do the the temporary thing uh to stimulate the uh, the permanent one um last week we again also had a 30 kids uh, 12 to 13 years old first year of high school uh, being landscape architects for for the past two or three months and designing all these different interventions uh to do in the science park to do with biodiversity so i, I think this is the fourth time third or fourth time we've worked with groups of students who did like really a full 
sort of assignment over a number of weeks or months and and they're also all extremely enthusiastic about these things i think the challenge for us uh, going forward is how do we actually get these interventions into the space so they go beyond just being a school exercise which is great for knowledge sharing but also get reflected into the into the science park itself and contribute uh, there but it was an, again a rewarding afternoon um we're also doing an honors module uh, with a university students so bachelor students who sort of do an honors uh, degree on deep ecology bringing in all kinds of different experts uh, to talk about uh, ecology from philosophical and scientific perspectives and next week they'll also be presenting all their interventions so i guess with these different kinds of projects we're trying to document them all very well so that we also kind of are able to show uh, the science park community all these different perspectives on what might happen uh, to the park in the coming years okay so that's uh, that's 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 activities from the previous uh, period um what we want to do now is do an urban landscape festival as a way to finalize our work this summer and to also kind of leave a stamp on the on the whole park um I guess I'll go into that at a, at a later time, but these are four learnings that we kind of folded into this idea of the landscape festival um, that I wanted to share. And, and, and the first of that is that we really found that green work is slow work. So first of all, you have the season. Sometimes you just have to wait half a year because it's not sowing season yet. So you can't do the thing you were planning to do. Uh, and in general, uh, the pace of the work is is different so for example the landscape festival will be a three-month festival of which one or two weeks are actively engaging audiences with programs and the rest is simply a different experience of the science park as an urban landscape so we're trying to stretch out time in that sense in the way we're programming um, but i won't stretch out the presentation um the second important learning point is you really need to connect with the community so I, th I guess that's obvious but uh in the experience you get um confronted with those facts again so we shifted our programming strategy in the last uh, months towards really always connecting with communities before we start programming and never doing just something that's open to a general audience because one time we get 50 uh submissions and it's too full and the other time there's only three people we don't really understand what happened there so we try to stabilize that by working with communities on site um and i guess like the last point i'll make is is this insight of ours that the way to argue for these projects is to really stress the multi-dimensional uh, qualities there's there's mental well-being there's aesthetics of the park there's reputation there's climate resilience there's always multiple dimensions to stress to argue the case for more more <clears throat> premium so uh, i'll leave it at that and uh, thanks for your attention wow thank you chris super um presentation super interesting so guys, let's leave the floor to some questions. Mm, I, I I just have one uh, regarding, oh, well, first of all, thank you. That, that's amazing. Uh, and thanks also to Lorenzo to the, for the previous presentation. Um, just uh, one question on, uh, let's say this community space okay you're putting together culture music uh, and ecology um would it be a physical space in the premises let's say or where you're mainly uh, acting now or will it be like uh, um, yeah, a program uh, promoted by by the university so how, how would it work is it going also yeah i mean to gain some physical yeah. space oh it's or? absolutely physical space so it's a it's a, it's a do you want to tell the story, Florcio, or shall I? Uh, it's a vacant plot, may, more or less, where the university now thought, ah, let's do something relevant, nice for the students, basically. And then they thought, okay, music and exercise. And then we said, naha, but actually ecology is as important for student well-being. And now we are in that, let's say, slow dance. They First, they have uh, somebody to explore, then they have somebody to set it up, then they have somebody to run it, and we're now integrated into exploring phase yeah yeah so we're we're learning uh, uh now more about these slow processes because this was actually a conversation already like half a year ago and then we were ready with our plans because first the idea was that the place would be there before summer um so we were ready for that but then uh, it appeared to be as chris is saying 
a slow process where you have to uh, apply for the plans and then get into the policy level. So actually today at the end of the day, we have a meeting about this and the new planning is that the place will be, that the location will be there in spring. And then it will be a collaboration of the university and the municipality and us probably, hopefully, uh, addressing these different uh, themes with one central quartier maker, like community manager uh, that is in charge. Yeah. And then we hope, because this will be a place for us, like a meeting place, hopefully we can do exhibitions there around urban ecology, but also we hope to uh, be able to experiment outside um, with greening uh, and biodiversity interventions. So, yeah. uh, and they are only focusing on the inside. So that's also a contribution from our urban ecology perspective to not only use insight, but also, um, yeah. The environment. The environment, exactly. That's great, thank you. And also I see a parallel between this and what Lorenzo was saying that somehow we are seeding with the project, you know, some, some things that maybe can mm -hmm. take a lot longer because they yeah. are somehow, yeah, related also with the time of the development, uh, redevelopment process of, of areas, no? So, so in case Lorenzo was saying before, the greenhouse maybe is not sure it will develop during the whole project lifespan, but will surely be related then to the uh, Alexotas Park, you know, and the same here, okay, you don't know the exact timing of activation of this community hub, let's call it like that, but you know that somehow it, it is now in a process where it yeah. can be developed, you know, so I, th I think that's already a great result. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. And I think it's always kind of experimenting with waiting for these type of processes uh, and just start, so that's also why we uh, started with the location on wheels as, as, as an action. Uh, yeah, so we always try to like estimate what can we already do and um, where do we have to be more diplomatic and, and wait for the actual goal from, uh, from a higher level. But that's also in that way a good reason to work with artists because they have a bit more free space. We as VAG also have to be more strategic. Uh, and then working with two really nice, uh, innovative artists, they, uh, yeah, they have this free space a bit more and they can, yeah, they have a different position at the park. So that will be interesting uh, in spring next year as well. Thank you. Very interesting. Lorenz. Yes, thanks. Um, Thanks, Guy, for your presentation. I've just shared the link in the chat about the project called Shilani Project. If you go through that, you will find not only the biodiversities, but a lot of activities that are going there, working on that since 2017. It's an artist and a urban planner, actually, that are living in this district. So that's the reason why. And my comment below was more about, uh, OK, maybe it's time to do these kinds of links and bridging people and pro also externally from the consortium i mean we are not actually uh, I'm, I'm always trying to facilitate this kind as a strategy of of all of the activities we carry out but then uh, you and dario in his comment has touched up an argument uh, that is uh that my question would like to investigate a bit better about the governance of this wild spots in urban areas and installations maintenance and sustainability of them not only throughout the active and active citizenships uh, because my probably we are creating this niche dedicated to okay we need data sets to demonstrate to give evidences and bring proof to the local governments so municipalities about the impact uh, and how this uh, areas sometimes are over regulamentated Milan's experience and uh, absolutely not regulated <laughs> which is, uh, they are free and in, in, they're living in this uh, anarchist environment where citizens around corners are able to do actually whatever they want whenever they want um, so there is a big difference in this in, in this approach uh, and uh, to me generate and communicate data out to, out of these spots that we are doing these interventions is the way to to let's say create a common ground where to start to build 
uh, I mean, at least 50%. We, we agreed on whatever is a community bottom-up activity that is going to involve citizens. But the definition itself of what would have an impact uh, goes along with the productions of these, with the extractions of this data, not only... So what is about Amsterdam dealing with these aspects? Because the governance is the goal, but to my point of view, probably 50% is still, let's say, not in your case. I mean, generally speaking, overall, all of the workshop and activities we see happening among European cities, we are just two, but we perfectly know that is a, is a topic, as, as Laura was actually telling at the beginning of the meeting. What, what really switched, I was reading some more sort of sort of uh, conservation uh, tech, academic texts on, on, on na nature conservation, etc. It's a whole field, of course. And one of the most persuasive arguments I found there is, let's say, against fortress um, conservation projects so where you really close off a piece of nature and le leave it to be pristine so to speak that that's actually really counterproductive um because if people are separated from it they won't care for it and then they also won't defend it so at some point it will be destroyed basically um so i guess that's a nice complement to this idea of measurement which we have the ambition but haven't infrastructured yet so definitely would like to talk to you about the possibilities there for the coming year but i guess it's love and data right you need both to prove your case so i guess that would be a short answer but i think you also wanted to say something no no oh. well that would be a short mm -hmm. answer um yeah longer answer is that the dutch love short mown grass and that there's a lot of like um services mowing the grass everywhere basically as as the park services so even if there's super low budget the grass will be cut um so you always have to go th with and through even if you have a lot of mobilized citizens that layer of uh, municipal services that's basically just cutting everything down every two weeks to a month and that's i guess and that's not even science park governance it's just municipal services organization subcontracting to to these private organizations ciao had us and um yeah, and so I that's think, another level you have to negotiate yeah and i don't know how this is in in kaunas but there there are experiments now in amsterdam for for example uh regarding the maintenance to do this more collaborative as well right so the municipality does their standard part or they might slightly change if, if they are flexible and then you can do part of it with the, with the residents and also for example as VAG you do a small part um, so the muni municipality is starting to be more open about this but it is difficult um, yeah it's really micro negotiations yeah. on plots and piece like they, they have to adapt their plans yeah, with their subcontractors yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's very minuscule work in that sense. Well, talking about just to give you a briefly update about what, what is going on after two years and a half at Giardino San Faustino in Milan, ex exactly related to this topic, they're planning the Milan's municipality to close the Giardino San Faustino project. It's ongoing on change.org, a petition to collect the signatures in these days. So that I, I'm sharing the link because it's a petition that should be, let's say, especially from us. I'm sorry to promoting this, but as a Milanese uh, citizens, I see that sometimes uh, in these negotiations, there are interests that are going actually like simply to opposite directions. Uh, and then the municipality in this case will take over the 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 project itself. So there was a, a, an extraordinary uh, case of bottom-up initiatives from uh, promoted by Cascina Biblioteca and then the reconversions in the district of Lambrate. We launched these petitions because the municipality, for instance, in Milan is gonna act uh, completely. It, there's no negotiations on that. When, when you have a player, uh, such a strong player that is in, intervening in this, um, this territory by saying, okay, we want to own the land now and do whatever we want over there. Yeah. Develop it. Zero, zero negotiations is level. Is level. Mm. Thanks Sorry. for sharing. Yeah. Adam. 
Yeah, no, but it, it, slightly stream of consciousness. There's so so many things to 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 think about. It's really rich presentation with, and and thank you for it. And also the synthesis of the learning in it is super super useful. Um, but as as an example of um, just it just seems to emphasise the 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 work of these projects in connecting and then integrating and aligning um, agendas. Uh, assembling publics and the different roles of the programmatic activations that serve to assemble publics and sort of foreground different agendas and then the sort of the physical touch points like your uh, mobile lab that are necessary to enable that work to continue and perhaps to give a face to this as it starts to sort of materialize literally materialize something that that starts to emerge um, really interesting examples and also, I think that, that that maybe as a group, we need to drill in more to what you touched on there around um, the, the permissions that we have within our different roles that different actors have. So what it is that an artist can do, what it, yeah. the, what it is that VARG can do, yeah. what it is that the university can do, and understanding the, you know, the, the different types of capacity and <laughs> what, what it is they can do. Yep. And, and, and how you can start to do that alignment and then if you want to start aligning and influence the direction of travel in the way that you described there when the university wants a recreational space and you're like okay maybe we can shape that and influence the direction of travel on that um so and, and being able to then track what you know what is the what's the value what's the currency that enables you to be able to influence direction of travel in those scenarios it feels to me that this is, yeah, this is at the heart of the learning of, of, of how we move towards and articulate um, the sort of collective um, inclusive approaches to, to development and regeneration. So yeah, just to, just to yeah, congratulate you and say thanks, thanks for sharing a great example. And I think that the heart of this in the, in the conversation that Lorenzo was just touching on and what you're talking about here, at the heart of this, it's about how does this work open up the regenerations it's something that people have been talking about time and again it's a term that comes up now really what this what we're trying to do here is open these things up and what's the value exchange that enables us to be able to convince these people that have the keys to to open up in those ways yeah thanks adam uh, well said don't have anything to add to that i think except that we maybe re you realize that you're actually a meanwhile party trying to do meanwhile stuff with other people that are far less <laughs> intermittently present right so you have to kind of like to find your place and to get that trust and to integrate yourself into all these processes is in itself quite a long pro process mm -hmm. it's not a meanwhile process to do meanwhile stuff i guess mm -hmm. Wonderful. Guys, I'm so sorry, but I need to close this call as I know that there are people <laughs> waiting for each other for individual calls. So apologize. Next time we will prolong officially the timing because I think these are really important discussions that we need to have increasingly because they are quite central. So as a follow up, important for Milan, Kaunas and Amsterdam probably to follow up directly between you guys. And uh, but maybe if you let us know if you have a, a, a specific meeting, maybe we can also share it to others. So if there are other pilots who want to join. So thank you so much, Lorenzo, Chris.